when you look at the market today, what do you see and how does this compare maybe to previous eras? Yeah, well, I can remember back around the year 2000 when, oh my God, somebody would get really upset if the cap rates came you know, down to a nine cap. I mean, everybody wanted at least a 10 or even a 12 cap back then. And you know, one of our top markets back then was Dallas, Texas. And, you know, and, and, and a lot of my clients that were further east, further west in California were buying properties there because they could actually land uh, like a 11 or 12 cap property. And so it, had we known that it was even possible for cap rates to compress as low as they are today, you know, uh, uh, sub five cap, we, we would have just, just laughed and thought that's, you know, that's the end of our industry. But, but what's amazing is that you're dealing with entrepreneurs. You know, there's a lot of talent, a lot of talented uh, sponsors that, that just know, they just know that's the right property. And they're still able to hit a home run in today's overpriced market. So. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that, right? I mean, you, I, I can't imagine what that must have been like buying 10, 11, 12 caps and, and you know, nice neighborhoods. And some of these, yes. you know, tier one markets like D- Dallas, Fort Worth, where, you know, obviously you're not finding a 10, 12 cap in some of the worst neighborhoods in Dallas today. So uh, right. really, really crazy that, you know, it has compressed so much uh, in that time frame. And, and it is also enlightening because I think it gets it starts to illustrate maybe um, a different POV, right? Because investors and, and industry professionals who've been in the industry for a longer period of time, you know, you mentioned that it's overpriced, right? And you talked about it being an overpriced environment. Whereas I think newer investors are looking at it to say, hey, this is just the environment as it is today. This is what it's sure. going for. We got to figure yeah. out, you know, how to make deals work. How, how do you reconcile that, right? Because in, in yeah. many regards, it is overpriced, but in some cases, yeah, it, it's, it's the market. It really, I hate to say this, it sounds really flippant. It sounds almost ignorant, but the price is just not as important as your business plan and your knowledge of the submarket and what's going on there. Because uh, my experienced sponsors, they, they could take a property that might, uh, let's just say a B, it's, a B, it's a C plus property and it's being priced as a B plus property. Yeah, but it's in a dang good neighborhood where, where you know, like uh, we have a client that recently purchased a property. I steered them away from uh, a cheaper property, uh, you know, in a C-class neighborhood in Oklahoma. And he bought one in his own backyard in C- uh, Seattle. Now, it's just that this is a C-class property that was older, but uh, in this in this submarket, property, it's, it's weathered well through three recessions. Property values have always gone up as, along with rents. So what you can't really do today is focus on that cash on cash return, which everybody, it's just in our brains. Like we want to think about how much are we going to earn a month from this investment? We've got to think about the long buck, not the short, short buck, because that's there's a lot of money in the long buck today. And does that, does that make sense? <laughs> It does. It does. I think it's a great answer, right? Instead of focusing on that cash on cash and maybe that initial cap rate, focus on the long view. What's the longer opportunity? Yeah. And if you understand that market and sub market, that's going to position you better for success than simply buying a property because it's a 10 cap or whatever the cap rate may be. So I think it's a great way to think about it. And I love the fact that you clarified and said, you know what, it's more about the business plan and the opportunity than just a cap rate. And I do think that yeah. makes you know uh, so much sense. And it's probably yeah. the reason some people are focused on value add today. Sure. I'll give you a good example. I'll tell you a story about one of my favorite clients. She's, she's done three deals with me. Her, her name is Charlotte. She goes by uh, Lottie. But anyway, uh, she actually, she bought this, she insisted, she wanted to own a property in Lincoln Park, Chicago. It's a hipster neighborhood up in just really impossible to find anything that makes sense there. All the built, most of the properties are either new because built on infill or they're just really old and they need work. She picked an older property just for as charming as heck, but it just at the price she wanted to pay in 2018, it didn't pencil to me. And I told her you're paying just as much as for this old property as what it would cost for an A property that was newly built. She said, well, I can't find one of those. Terry, don't 
telling me all this pessimistic stuff. I'm buying this property. So I could actually, I actually could not finance it for her because it didn't pencil for even my bridge lending. But she found a private lender. And, and just to cut to the chase of this is that now we're getting, when we got into 2021, she contacted me about doing another deal somewhere else. And I asked her, I said, well, how's that Lincoln Park looking for you? And she said, no, I could believe this. But so anyway, so that property actually, uh, it more just in that period of time, she more than doubled her cash investment. And that brings in the equity multiple, which is what you really should focus on today. And that's taking a look at holding the property. Nowadays, you've got to do that probably for more like five years. But if you could double your cash investment, then that doesn't sound too bad. And so that's basically what she did. But she really had almost no income from, very low income from operations for the first two years. And then well, with rents increasing, oh my God, up close to 18% in that neighborhood, once she did the improvement, the value adds, she, she hit a home run. So I, I didn't think, I mean, I'm always learning. You know, it's like, that was that seemed pretty risky to me, but she bought in, number one, in a good neighborhood. She had a really solid business plan. She knew the rent comparables. And uh, even though they were, they were on A properties, not on C properties, but she brought the property up and she she, she did it. She, you know, she's, she was also experienced, you know. I think some great insights right there, right? First of all, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, I lived in Chicago for eight years, so I'm very familiar with Lincoln Park. It is a, an A-class neighborhood, one of the most desirable neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. So, you know, to find an opportunity there, um, there was always going to be some built-in demand. So to find a property that was not maybe an A-class property in an A-class area, it's a classic value-add approach, right? Find a B or C property in an A area, renovated, right. bring it up to the rest of that, that A-class neighborhood. And now you've built in some great value. And I, I think that just underscores your point about having the right business plan. Even if the lender and other folks aren't on board, as an investor, you've got to understand what is the right business plan for this area? What gives you the confidence that you're going to be able to execute? And if you've got that experience, you've got people on your team who have that experience, it makes it a little bit easier to move forward. Um, I'm curious to hear from you. Like you mentioned that you guys couldn't finance that. Even your bridge lenders wouldn't do it. And with valuations kind of all over the place today, are you seeing other investors who find opportunities, but you're having a hard time or you're seeing people have a hard time getting deals financed based on the underwriting? Yeah. Yeah, I would say probably in our, our strongest markets like LA, San Francisco, Chicago, well, you know, and a lot of other large cities, New York City, and so on, we can get deals like that done because just the, the level of income that people who choose to rent have support much higher rents. And quite often we can show evidence that we could raise the rents. It's really not uh, it's not a let's wait and see and guess scheme. That's not going to get you the loan you want. What it does take is actually coming up with sales comparables that you could show the lending source. And if it's, you know, and also, uh, you know, if you could find a property that that has under market rents and you could do some inexpensive value adds, this is not the time to buy a property and rehab it because those, there's such a scarcity of multifamily properties, especially there's just a scarcity. But even the properties that are really run down are gonna be so overpriced, it's not gonna pencil it for you. So uh, what we can still get done today actually, because we actually, because I love actually taking a property with my sponsors and help give it a shine, you know, and pitch it to our money sources. And what we could, what you have to do, be willing to do for the property, uh, like first is we can we can do um, a this property in Lincoln Park was just just so vastly overpriced that that's why I could not do it. But a private investor in that neighborhood saw the value, and so I mean in Chicago actually was you know saw the value. So, but in most cases, what we can do is take a bridge loan and. A bridge loan is actually going to be a bridge lending that actually could take a look at 80% of cost today. If you're going to be doing some value adds and then take a look and then lend you seven, up to, let's say, 70, 75% of, uh, you know, a value once it's, you know, the improvements are completed and it's stabilized. So, so some, quite often we get, we get deals done with bridge lending today that, but, but it's got to have a dang good uh, business plan, you know, supported by fact. Yeah, so. I think that's really helpful. And, you know, I think that one of the challenges, and I was just talking to a good buddy of mine, Reed Goosens, who we, we did a deal with Reed 
uh, some years ago, and we were talking about that deal. And one of the challenges that he mentioned was, um, you know, we put uh, agency debt on that loan and there was, um, you know, a prepayment penalty if we sold early. And that actually limited our options on the exit because, you know, the prepayment penalty was so high. When you look at the current environment, you know, when you talk about bridge debt, agency debt, the different type of loan products that are out there, one, just set the table and describe, you know, the the pros and cons of these. And then I'm curious to hear, like, what do you think people should be looking at or how should we look at a deal and decide what loan product is right based on our business plan and the deals we're finding? I would love to answer that question, John. That that's. Yeah, that's my specialty. Okay, let's start. Let's start with community banks. Okay, so uh, community banks really hate this cap rate compression. They've been around. They know the neighborhood. They know the areas. They've been around. They remember two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, when actually uh, properties were. Per, you know, it was at the end of a like I think, I think at least a six year or eight year bull market on real estate, and uh, properties uh, had really gone up like they have today. And they had they saw they have seen property values not so much on multifamily and good strong um, neighborhoods, but uh, other types of commercial properties that did go down in value and, and cap rates went up. So they you know so that made trouble for them with the with the regulators. So community banks are the most cautious. They're, the, they're quite often the least entrepreneurial. They don't like taking risks. So that's probably um, not the very best source today uh, for. Uh, you know, if you if you're going to be buying a property uh, that's going to be at a let's just say uh, sub you know five and a half cap, you know five, sub you know six, sub six cap even, which in a lot of good neighborhoods that's the case today. So uh, you mentioned eight, okay. So what I want to bring in too is what I want to bring in is credit unions. Credit unions are new or new or it's over the last five six years to co- commercial lending. Uh, and, but because they don't pay income taxes and they have a lot of, you know, they could actually, they have a lot of money to lend more than they, they possibly can lend. Uh, you know, they could cut you a sweet deal. And uh, if they, and they're, but you have to pretty much have some sort of connection to that area because because their charter is going to, you know, insist that you have to belong based upon a certain criteria. But, but, but credit unions could actually, uh, you know, they can, you know, lend at, 75% LTV, they could give you a good rate, you know, for 30 year amortization and you know, fix the rate for even 10 years. So that's something a lot of folks don't think about, but if you want to buy out of state, that's probably not going to work for you. Uh, so agency, agency debt, if you're, okay, so uh, agency debt is not going to work unless you're going to hold the, the property for five years or longer. and you don't, we really don't see very many five-year fixed Fannie or Freddie loans anyway, because the pricing doesn't work out favorably. It's going to be probably a little bit more, it's going to be a higher rate probably yeah, than a 10-year. And the other thing too is that with, with, where bridge financing comes in, John, is that, um, is that almost all lenders, community banks, uh, agency loans as well, uh, they actually stress the interest rate. So if you're, let's just say rate, rates are really good right now. Let's just say you're getting a 4% rate. Well, a bank's going to stress that out uh, to at least 6% and uh, and probably Fannie Mae to at least five and a quarter unless you're getting a, you know, a 15 year fixed or longer. So so what happens is that it's difficult to buy price it, to buy properties at this high uh, cap, these low cap rates, high prices today with you know, conventional financing, agency financing does work, but what you do have to be willing to do is bite it on that repayment penalty, which, uh, you know, you know you can, what I recommend, I mean, a seven-term hold right now is just about perfect for agency financing. You can usually you can probably get out maybe because uh, properties keep going up. Keep in mind that more uh, earnings come from appreciation than into their source in investment property. and properties have been appreciating going up in value since the 1880s in America, since they've been keeping track. There's been many dips and valleys and peaks and so on, but they always have gone up. So if you could think about a longer term hold, at least five years, maybe seven years uh, on some of your investments, uh, you could definitely come out with a winning winning business plan on that. With it, you know, certainly with agency financing, which is probably the lowest 
right now. No, great insights right there from community banks, credit unions, uh, understanding what agency debt is looking like. There are a lot of different options right there. And it sounds like if you can get, you know, those uh, the credit unions or get some of these bridge, um, these bridge lenders, those are going to be your best options right now, unless you plan on holding long term. And then obviously agency uh, plays a significant role there. But really great insights right there on what to do Um, as, as an investor. What are those questions, right? Because I think everyone always focuses on interest rate and, and, oh, what kind of interest rate can I get? But we know that that is not the only important component of a loan. What are some of the other things that we should be paying attention to when looking at a loan product for a deal? Yeah, well, you certainly, you, met, you mentioned, okay, first of all, what I want to back up is just start out and say it's absolutely, it's absolutely essential. It's not a question about, you know, let's just see which way the wind blows. You've got to know your business plan. You've got to know exactly what your whole period of time is. You need to know, you need to do a really sharp uh, pro forma, strong underwriting on the deal today. You, know, you gotta know where you're starting. And from that, you will, you're gonna know, it's not a time just to like, well, let's just see what happens. If prices go up enough or rents go up enough, maybe in two years we'll sell it. Okay, so right now, if you're buying at these high prices, you know, poss- possibly in three years, two years is unlikely, but you do need to know what your end game is. And then from that, you can back into what loan product is going to be a fit for you for, for that for that deal. So once again, if if you're thinking about uh, just doing some value adds and let's just say flipping the property in three years, then you are going to have to, you know, you, you probably, you know, like one thing that's good about credit unions is they don't, at least the federally chartered ones, is they don't have prepayment penalties. Otherwise, you're going to need a declining prepayment penalty of a three, two, one. So you could always afford a one percent prepayment penalty. Now you mentioned rates, and what it really, you know, for a short-term hold, rates are not really all that important. For a long-term hold, they are more important because that's going to add to your uh, cash-on-cash return and your overall income during that period. So, but I would say. Um, What's really a benefit, for instance, let's just say if what's really good about taking an agency loan, for instance, is that you can have an option of, let's say, you know, at a minimum of, let's say, two years, actually one year, but two years is more realistic, maybe three years of getting supplemental financing for that loan. So now you could take cash out and perhaps use it to put down as a sponsor or as a group on another property and have your cake eat it too. And that's not something that we could go up to at least 75% of the current appraised value. So, so that's one of the benefits of agency financing. Now, I'm not sure if I completely answered your question, John. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate you clarifying that. The, the, the follow-up question was on, as we are looking at you know, what loan products we want to get. I think a lot of people focus on interest rate, but oh, yeah. you said, hey, that, that's one element. But what are the other things that we need to be paying attention to? Okay, so um, actually what affects, okay, what affects uh, your cash on cash return the most is getting the lowest payment financing you can. And with such high prices, that is really makes sense. And so if you could find a loan that has interest only payments, even if, let's just say, if it's a larger property, for instance, today, we can get you a bridge loan, let's just say, uh, maybe in the mid five, five and a half percent range. Now, that, that might sound terrible, like, oh my God, it's so much, it's so high. It really doesn't really matter because if it's interest only payment, it's going, it's going to be very similar in payment to, a, to bank financing at 4% with a 25 year amortization. So, so, if, so, so, but now we can lend you more money based upon the future, you know. And so, actually, uh, even and agency loans, CMBS loans have interest only payments of anywhere from two years to to longer. So, for, yeah. And so, it, keeping your payments as low as possible is really important. But also, once again, if your strategy, let's say, is to raise rents, um, just think of you know, you know, if there's nothing that will affect. Uh, your cash and cash return more than raising rents, even much more so than starting out of the gate with the best interest rate. So uh, I just want to interject right now that uh, one really positive thing about today's economy is inflation, because uh, 
just from my experience, of course, we've never, we haven't had inflation like this for 40 years, like in the 7% range. But uh, one of the things that happens that people, uh, for some reason, like last year, rents nationally went up, uh, according to, to Zillow, 10% nationally. And in places like we're, we're lending quite a bit right now in Boise, Idaho, they went up 20.6%. You know, the average home went up to uh, about 500,000 there, you know, and the average home is 360,000 now nationally. So people are used to prices going up and, and so many people have been priced out of the housing market and they have good jobs or either retired or they're millennials and they, they could afford higher rents and they're, they're not going to give up that living style and pay less. So we're in an environment right now where rents will likely continue going up which is more important than interest rate right now is just knowing that you really can raise that rent uh, 10, you know, 10%. Uh, you know, so we're still historically, you know, five or 6% might be where you might be at. So. No, great points there. I mean, you talked about the, inf- the impact inflation is having first and foremost, understanding that property values are going up, home values are going up. More people are going to have to rent based on that because the incomes are not going up at the same level. So it's not like that right. paycheck went up 10% as well. So you're going to have more renters and rents are continuing to increase. It's going to make it a little bit easier to hit those yeah. business plan objectives and uh, continue to find more yeah. renters for these deals. Yeah, we, we, but we also... Just to be a little contrary, we are also do have a shortage of workers right now. Absolutely, uh, yeah. even even for medium, let's just say for, even for medium income jobs. So, so uh, you know, wages are go, are going up, you know, a bit right now. So, yeah, I think it's all you know fairly favorable from that standpoint. Yeah, wages are going up. They're just not going up at the ten to twenty percent level uh, to match kind of the 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 yeah. (laughs) So I I think the other thing that you talked about was just you know um, interest rates are important, but not as important depending on the business plan. You know, if you're going to hold something for two years, you know, a a point here or there is not going to make the difference of being successful or not being successful versus the actual ability to impact your business plan. But if you are holding longer, then obviously that interest rate is going to impact the cash flow. So it's more about understanding how much do you have to pay each month to the lender versus how much cash flow you have. And then again, what is your long-term business plan for that property? Um, I I would just add that, you know, understanding the prepayment penalty um, is really important. Again, go back to the business plan. Do you have a prepayment penalty or not? Um, And then are there other... I, I guess lesser discussed elements of a loan, whether it be um, other provisions or you know other things that people maybe should know but don't really talk yeah. about. Well, well, actually, uh, there are. Okay, so for the agency loans, for instance, you, to qualify, you have to have experience. Uh, not so much with Freddie Mac. If, if, if you want to buy a property within a hundred miles of your own, of where you live, you could actually get a Freddie Mac loan without experience or just with some uh, single family home rental experience. But for Fannie Mae, you have to have two years of uh, five unit of only five units or more. You have to have a, for agency loans, you have to have a net worth of uh, equal to the size of the loan. And there's no lender today, even hard money lenders, that's going to allow you to be broke at the closing table. So you've got to have, yeah, and that's one of the things that I really want to stress is, is, is how important it is. Because this, that's the one thing I have to say is that getting through like the Great Recession, uh, my investors in uh, and commercial real estate that actually uh, had a rainy day fund, you know, and also could break even at seventy five percent occupancy. In other words, they put more down. They made it through the recession. They did not lose their properties at all. And they're still, they were able to actually pick up some of the distressed properties from those that uh, those investors that always had to buy another property and were broke at the closing table. So uh, so having uh, having some cash is really important uh, to lenders, all lenders today when at the closing table. So, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Great, great points there, Terry. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the book, right? You wrote this amazing book that has been widely recognized as number one uh, book and, and a new release on Amazon back in 2020, the Encyclopedia of Commercial Real Estate Advice. Um, one, why did you decide to write this book? And I want to talk about some of the advice that the book shares. Okay, thank you for asking me that. But it's really kind of strange. Uh, in April of 1919, I get this email 
And it's from an, the executive managing editor at Wiley Publications. They publish the, they're known mostly for publishing the Tummies books. And he just said, I had some articles on Forbes and on LoopNet. He said, I love your writing. Would you consider writing a book called The Commercial Real Estate Encyclopedia? Well, I thought it was a joke. You know, because it just came into my email, you know, just like a lot of people have always wanted to write a book, but I kind of forgot about it for many, many years. And so I, but, so I contacted the guy, picked up the phone right away, started talking and I said, hey, this sounds really interesting. You're, you know, I, uh, I would, yeah, I'd really love to write this book, but an encyclopedia, Ugh, I mean, I, that just sounds so boring. I just don't really want to write a boring book. And so he said, he said, hey, I don't know if you could help me out, but my editorial committee, committee is meeting in four days, can you get me a proposal? And you know, let's just see where it goes. Do you mind just getting a proposal? Well, I proposed a, what I proposed was an encyclopedia on commercial real estate, absolutely everything from A to Z on commercial real estate with a how-to book. So the book, the, my greatest compliment of the book is that it's a great read. People say that they can't put it down because there's lots of stories from my clients and my own experience. And so, but, but otherwise, just for somebody who's a passive investor, the book is really will give you everything you need to know to be an investor in commercial real estate because, and that's what you, and you really need to take responsibility and get, you know, know how to crunch deals, understand how to determine risk and so on. And so and my, my book is designed to do that. Out of the, the stories that you have in the book, what's one that you hear from readers most about? Which one jumps out most of them? Yeah, well, um, well, actually, uh, this is kind of a funny one, but people love the story called, uh, uh, it was all about toilets. And this is, this is something that happens when you buy an older property like in Lincoln Park. This property wasn't in Lincoln Park, but what happened is that this uh, older lady was getting ready to retire, but uh, uh, bought this property, uh, 18 units, and it had been built during the 30s, late early 40s. And, problem is that the sewer line uh, that went through underneath it was uh, uh, was steel. I mean, it was actually, um, what is it? Like a cast iron skillet. It was that kind of, you know. So anyway, it corroded. And so what happened is that after about two months, when somebody flushed the toilet in one apartment, unfortunately, if methane gas was, was accumulated and broke loose right then, it would force the contents into somebody else's apartment's toilet. And so it was just a really nasty, God. and the first, the first property manager just went fit, that was beyond them, they, they quit. And, they, and then uh, she didn't know what to do. So I recommended another property management company and they've got the sewer line expert who fixed the problem. But the problem is that these are things that are unforeseen that when you buy an old property and you don't think about having a major cost of having to take up the subflooring and actually replacing a sewer line, you know, so. But it's also a funny story. So, oh man, those are the nightmare issues that you don't yeah. want to deal with. And obviously, yeah. that's when in due diligence you want to find that so you can yeah. address it appropriately the first time and and not have that issue. But man, that's a tough one. Yeah, excellent. It's just and also I'm, I'm not going to go into this, but I have eleven ways property managers can actually steal from their clients. And this is more for smaller mom and pop property managers, just that my clients have experienced. So it's, that's kind of like entertaining as well. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Terry. Hey, where can people find this book? Uh, it's actually on sale right now on Amazon, and it's Barnes and Noble. Uh, any uh, certainly of the larger book dealers have it. So, All right, we'll make sure we link to that as well, so you can check out this book. Uh, great one there. And for listeners who want to get in touch with you, learn a little bit more about you, the experience you have, or even working with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? Okay, they could reach me at apartment. Loan, apartmentloanstore.com, just terry at apartmentloanstore.com or uh, terrypainterauthor.com. And I have a YouTube channel that has the same title as the book. And uh, that's, that, that's the best way. Awesome. I love it, man. Well, listen, let's jump into a round of insights. Terry, give me a failure or an apparent failure that sets you up for later success. Yeah, when I when I was quite young in my uh, mid twenties, I bought a, an apartment, com a small apartment complex with my mother, and it was a, it was brand new. We thought this was going to be great. What we didn't realize is we were buying in a working class uh, blue collar neighborhood in uh, Springfield, uh, uh, Oregon. And anyway, so what happened is that after about a year, these brand new units were totally trashed, 
and we couldn't get the we had to evict people, which we had no experience doing. So actually, what I learned is how important it is to actually, unless you have experience uh, in you know in D class neighborhoods, you know buying in a good neighborhood. That, that was a hard lesson. <laughs> we we had to sell sell for probably uh, seventy five percent of the dollar to get out. Oh, man. Tough one, tough one. But it set you up to focus on loans and be more successful in the space. Yes. All right. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Well, actually, I just actually get a lot from uh, you know just uh, TED ED lessons. It's actually you can listen to it, and it just gives you a lot of just just like light bulbs go off in my head all the time when I listen to those. So. There you go. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year, besides your own, of course. Okay, well, actually, uh, there's a book called 4,000 Weeks. That's about as long as I've lived so far. It's a long time. But what it's about is it's also has a subtitle called Time Management for Mortals. And it's really, if you think about it, we time really messes us up. It's something that hasn't been around for human beings that long, but it's really, it's, it's philosophical, it's spiritual. It's a little bit on the woo-woo side for some people, perhaps. But it really takes a look at how it doesn't really deal with techniques for time management, which is what you would think. It really deals with what really messes up our life when we get like for me, I, I, never, I always feel like I should have gotten more done that day. And that's really counterproductive. It doesn't make anything that doesn't make you feel good is not, you know, a good strategy. So that's a great book. Well, speaking of getting more done, what's a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals? This is something I actually learned years ago to do, and that's to focus. I focus on the highest payoff activities first, not just for the most fun. If I'm prone to distraction, but I always know at least one or two imperative activities I need to get done. And I try to get those out of the way, and then I can feel good that I got something important done. Yeah. There you go. I love that. All right. Give me your number one insight for commercial real estate investing. Uh, okay. Not to just like when you meet, let's just say the perfect woman or man on, you know, when you're dating, not to fall in love at first sight, really get to know that property, really get to know them. That's, that's it. Turn over, no. Yeah, just, yeah. See them when they wake up, see them when they wake up in the morning. No, yeah. I love it there. Great, great. Insight okay. there, Terry. Oh man, well, Terry, I know that uh, as we're recording this, you've got a beautiful backdrop behind you. You're down in the Dominican Republic. I know you also split your time between the DR and Portland. So I'm going to let you pick, but give me your favorite place to grab a bite to eat. Oh my gosh. Okay, right now, it's actually where I'm living right now. It's, uh, we have mostly, uh, we don't have very many good restaurants in town in the Dominican Republic, but a little town called Loop Around that I live in, but there's a, there's a place uh, run by a couple of Canadian, young Canadians called The North. And everything is just fresh. It's a very simple menu, but there's just incredible fresh wraps and wraps and tacos and just a very, you know, just amazingly good food. So I nobody will it. probably come here and find it, but if you do go to Loop Run, that's, it's called The North. Loop Run The North. All right, man. Well, listen, I, I just really appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing some great insights. A couple of get big takeaways for me. One, um, when we link, think about the market, recognizing that, hey, interest rates, you know, um, they, they're not as important based on the business plan. Important, obviously, but uh, the business plan is the most important thing. So keep that in mind when, when choosing your interest rate, but also understanding that the market has shifted, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, uh, you saw cap rates in the double digits. You're not seeing that today. And a lot has changed and we don't anticipate the market necessarily going backwards. So you've got to find a way to operate in an environment where maybe a lot of properties are overpriced. So just understand the business plan is a smart way to approach it today. And then just making sure that you pick the right loan product, understanding the different lenders, the different options out there, that there's more involved than just the interest rate. You want to understand prepayment penalties. You want to understand the whole suite of what you're going to be taking on and just be smart with your business plan at the end of the day. That's going to be the biggest thing you can do is have the right business plan for the property you're going to be buying. Uh, again, Terry, for folks who want to learn more, um, I know that we uh, we have your website here, but again, where should they reach out to find more information about you? This is uh, terrypatriorauthor.com uh, and uh, apartmentloanstore.com. Be great places. I love it. So. Terry, thank you again for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure having you. Hope you have a good one. Take care. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks.